technology. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's a blessing for my wife, Uni, and I to be able to join you today. We thank you very much for the privilege and the honor of being able to join you here. If anybody gets tired this morning and falls asleep, they will be sorry. Because I brought something with me. I'm not afraid to use it. This is, a, this is an arrow from a tribal group we're going to talk about this morning. So I'll just keep it right here and I'll be watching you. No, uh, thank you very much for having us. Uh, we've looked forward to this opportunity for quite some time. Now we're here and we get to see your wonderful faces. And unfortunately, you have to look at my ugly face. But it's only for 45 minutes. <clears throat> Uh, as in the introduction this morning, our ministry grew out of the Tijuana dump. Uh, not a very attractive place to start a ministry, but out of that community of very, very problematic people uh, living on top of the, the dump of Tijuana, Mexico, a ministry movement was started there. And then it later went on, spread into a number of the, the violent uh, communities, barrios south of the border. And, and there's two focuses that make up our, our ministry. One is those barrios, not just in Mexico, and some other places as well. And then also with the very primitive, uh, some of them are unreached tribal groups in which we're working with them in conjunction with a number of uh, other ministry, ministry teams. And the focus of all of that is on discipleship. It's a process in which our focus is to see, and it's multiplying, it's a blessing, to see those who were our ministry focus of yesterday, those who were, who were the ministry of yesterday, now, today, being the ministers and going out and reaching others and discipling them so that those new disciples will be able to also go on to reach others and make disciples of them. That's kind of like God's plan for discipleship. There are individuals like, uh, I want to mention three of them this morning, uh, Maybe they're an example that doesn't necessarily fit the context here, but uh, like Oscar, who his life was wrapped up in before in taking life, a serial murder, but one who found God's grace, had an encounter with God's grace, and went from being one who took life to now being one who shares life with others. Or another example might be a guy we, we uh, have in our little ministry circle. His name is Ramon. Ramon was a trafficker, a drug trafficker. Fairly successful one until he got caught. Then he spent a little bit of time behind bars. He had a long stint to be able to meditate on his ways. But he went from a guy that uh, planted darkness in many, many souls. And now he's an ambassador of light and taking that light to others. Or one of our dear friends, whose his name is Julian. Julian uh, was for many years a witch doctor, a very sought-after witch doctor, who dedicated his life to curse others and bring harm to others. And now, his whole life is wrapped up in this idea of being a blessing to others, taking the blessing of Christ to others. Now, every one of these uh, three examples, every one of these guys have something in common, and that is from the time they had an encounter with God's mercy and grace, they returned. They didn't just take His grace, take the blessing of what it means to receive eternal life and go their own way, they return to give thanks. And in their idea of what it looked like to go back to God and give thanks, they went back to, to put their lives in the control of the very one that gave them life to start with. And that transformation, uh, that life transformation uh, process I don't know how this sounds in many of our contexts here in the, in the United States, and so I kind of retool it in my, our way of thinking. 
But, uh, you know, we use the word faith, the importance of the Christian faith. But I would say that Christian faith does not necessarily bring transformation to our lives. In the, in the case of the guys I just mentioned and those that they represent, yes, they came to a place of faith, but something way more than that. Not just an intellectual faith of saying, yes, I believe in the doctrines or I believe in what the Bible teaches. They came to a place of full, sold out, complete conviction of who God is and who they are before Him. And that brought about life transformation. It's the difference between just believing in God or believing that He exists or believing that the Word of God is true it's a kind of belief that moves one from being totally out of control in their life to having an encounter with God's grace and His mercy, going back to the very God that gave them that life and saying, you gave me this life, I want to put my life before you. I want to give you the control of my life. I now want to be a God follower. And that's an awesome, an awesome uh, idea of what a God follower looks like. This morning I want to ask you a question. It's a question for me in, in, in the first place, but I share it with you as well. Is your Christianity based in a list of doctrines and theological arguments or an intellectual faith? Or is your Christianity rooted in the idea that Jesus gave me eternal life and therefore my life is not my own and I want to go back and I want to recognize that and put my life before him and let him be the one that controls my life from this point forward. Now the ministry of Jesus was kind of like all about discipleship. That's what it all started with, and that's the direction he took, and that's what the whole entire focus of Jesus was all about. He started off his earthly ministry doing what? We find him walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he came up to individuals, and he pointed at them and said, Believe in me, right? Wrong? Wrong. He went up to individuals and he said, You, follow me, and I will make something new out of your life way beyond what you can imagine. I will turn your life into something totally, totally new. And it may feel like it's out of control for you. But do you believe me? And that's where we start off the Bible narrative of men that were uh, mending their fishing nets, they were involved in their, their regular life, and they looked up and they didn't just have an intellectual faith in Jesus, there was something that compelled them to leave what was normal to them, a life in which they could kind of know what to expect, the normal things of life. They left that behind and they got up and they followed him. Now fast forward uh, the story of Jesus. What does he end with? His earthly ministry. He ends his ministry by looking at those same disciples. Some of the same ones that he called at the very beginning and said, follow me. And then he says, now. We're not going to extend the story too much, but just that last little part of the Gospels. He says, now you. Go into all the world and hand out the four spiritual laws. Right? No. He said, go into all the world and make, help me out here, make disciples. That was his whole entire focus. He started by calling disciples. He ended by sending his disciples to do what? To multiply that program. To go out and make other God followers. Now sometimes we find a, a quick out and we say, well, uh, I don't have a perfect testimony, so who am I to go out and call others to follow Christ? Well, look at the, look at the life of Paul. Was Paul a good example? He's a murderer, right? 
So we put our head down with a little bit of humility, or a lot of humility, and we recognize that, you know what, I'm probably not much of a disciple. But I'm learning. And we can be like Paul, who said, follow me, as I follow Christ. Now our modern Christianity today says, don't put your eyes on man, put your eyes on God. The problem is, the people that surround us in the world, don't, they're looking for God, they're not going to find Him in a, sitting on a cloud. He's put a portion of Christ in every one of us, His disciples, to represent Him and go out and be His ambassadors to a lost world. So between the beginning of Jesus' discipleship program and the end, what do we find in the middle? He lived out a life of discipling. Now, why that confronts us in our modern, uh, modern Christianity today is when we embrace that idea of the fact that my life is not my own. I want to go back. And I want to put myself before God. And I want to thank Him. Not only do I want to thank Him verbally or in a worship service, I want to put my life back in the hands of the very one who gave me that life. You know why that isn't, that's um, not always comfortable to do? It's not comfortable for me either. It says, I'm giving up control of my life. Uh, I want to challenge you with something. It's just something that I'm trying to learn as I, I'm a very slow learner. As I go through life trying to learn a little lesson, and that is that many times we have our faith in God, but we have our trust in ourselves. And to be lined up in the true Christian life, not the Christian faith, the Christian life. We have to put our trust where our faith is. And that's uncomfortable. All of us, every single one of us in here, likes the idea of making our own plans, kind of marking out what we want to do in life, planning things. We like the expected. You know, in the mission field, things usually go wrong. It's just like, that's the way it goes. Uh, things don't go the way you want them to go. There's always surprises. But that's true in everybody's life. And as much as some of the, the younger folks here today, you're, you're planning out your career, and you've got your career track ahead of you, and you have your plans made, and you edge your way towards your plans, and maybe four or five years go by, and you feel something that just isn't right in the middle of your chest. And you go to the doctor, and through a series of tests, you find out that you have terminal cancer. You know, all your plans fall apart. Everything just unravels before you. We like the idea of being in control. We like the idea of feeling like, I have my confidence in me. We don't always have so much confidence in God. We have our faith in Him, but we need to move our trust over into His hands as well. It's a lesson that I'm fairly slow at learning, but I'm working on it. And there's a story that reminds me of a terrible experience where one day I realized that, wow, I really don't have the control over the things in my life like I would like to. Now this is way down in the Amazon jungle, way towards the Brazilian border. With a, There's a picture album over there on the table if you want to look at some pictures of these, these folks. These are very, very primitive tribal people. They've never seen electric light. Never seen a city. They don't have a numbering system that goes past three. It's a totally, totally different universe. These people live in a totally different world. But they're people, and they're people that deserve the opportunity of being able to have the word that you have in your hands today and be able to understand it in their own language. That's what the whole mission effort is all about. Not just evangelism, but taking the word and putting it into flesh, somebody else's culture and language, and living it out with them. And so we were going from one village with the idea of getting to this other village because there was a bunch of people dying of malaria. Malaria is the, the, the big killer of the Amazon. In fact, most children die before they're five years old in their world because of malaria today, still to this day. 
So where are we? Well, we're about almost three hours in a Cessna plane to the little airstrip in the middle of the jungle where some missionary friends live. And then from there, we're going to go down one river, up another river, up another river, and then about eight hours on a small, very, very narrow, I guess you could call it a stream, a very, very narrow river called the Iowain. That's the indigenous word that means blood water. It's about an eight-hour trip up that little stream. The problem was when we got up to the stream, we found the water was very, very low. Uh, when you're traveling with an outboard motor on a very, very narrow stream, you like the water to be up kind of high. Not super high, because if it's up really high, then you're going through all the limbs. You know what's hanging in the limbs? All kinds of stinging ants, stinging caterpillars, uh, spiders, all kinds of spiders. Little spiders, big spiders, huge spiders, and sometimes snakes. And I don't, I'm not really into snakes. I don't like snakes. So I, I don't like it when the water is really, really high. But you don't want it to be really low either. You want it kind of in the middle. So when, you, when the water is up more or less at a middle level, then... There's every once in a while there's trees you have to go over or underneath and different obstacles because the trees fall over the river and there's rocks out there and everything. But when we started our, our day, we started off in the dark. We traveled down river and then up the next river and then up the next river. We had gone up only a few hundred yards on the EOA and then we came up to tree trunk. And they were laying on the ground. Some of them were, we couldn't, we couldn't jump over them. When I say jump over them, I mean, when you see the, the log across the river, if you think you can get the boat over the top of it, you give the motor all the power it has. And you tell everybody to hold on. And you just run the boat, try to run over the top of the, the log and pull the motor up at the last minute so you don't wreck the motor. So we were jumping over the ones we could. And then we got the other ones he couldn't jump over. And we weren't planning on cutting a bunch of trees. And so uh, you get to the ones that there's a little space underneath. Everybody tries to grab the log and push the canoe underneath the log to be able to continue on the trip. But then there was a lot of, we just had to cut them out of the way. Well, we didn't count on that. So we spent all day long cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. And we, we advanced very, very little. The plan was to get there that same night. So we didn't bring any food. Well, the first day's gone by and we didn't advance very much. We didn't know this is going to be a three-day trip, but we had to get there because we had a box of medicine and it was myself and a, a number of uh, believers, God followers, indigenous believers from the tribe, and we wanted to get up there and help these people in this other village. So... We're hungry, our hands are all torn up, we're tired. You know, usually you, you get breakfast out of the jungle. That's the supermarket. A turkey, a monkey, a deer, anything. You, the Indians ate everything. So you just whatever moves, you shoot it, and that's your breakfast. But that day we didn't see anything. So we're hungry, nothing. Now it's the morning. We get up, we start again, and chopping and chopping, and no food. Well, later that afternoon... I'm driving the, the motor of this long canoe, and we're in a part, some parts are like the swamp, very, very wide, very swampy. And then there's other parts where the river's really, really narrow, and where it's narrow like that, the water's deeper, but the, the floor of the jungle's up higher than the roof here, than the ceiling. And so you're like in a little alleyway, kind of just moving up really slowly, kind of going around the turns, <clears throat> being careful not to hit a rock or a log. The guy that sits in the front of the canoe has uh, a couple duties. Uh, the shotgun always goes in the front of the boat. You never want to sit in front of the guy with the shotgun. Bad idea. Because if there's a monkey running across a vine or a limb or something, and the guy's trying to shoot the monkey and your head gets in the way, bad plan. So the shotgun always goes to the guy in the front of the boat. Okay? And so he's, uh, everybody's looking for a monkey or something to eat, but also he's supposed to be marking out the any obstacles that he sees under the water. So if you see a tree trunk under the, on this side, he's going he's gonna to help me by signaling that there's something he sees under the water here or here or all the way across. So I'm watching him and trying to drive the motor through the, through the skinny passage there. Everybody else is looking around for a monkey or a turkey when all of a sudden, 
people are sitting up in the front of the boat, looking up, you know, the jungle's way up above us, and they turn around and they give me this signal. This is probably international. What does it mean? Oh. International, right? And so I just turned off the motor. Now everybody's looking up on the bank really, really excited. And I look up and I don't really see anything. I'm further back than they are. And they're all excited. So now the boat is drifting back with the current. And the motor hits on the side of the bank on the sand. And everybody looks back and they start passing the shotgun back to me. Why? Because they're out in the middle of the river where the current is. And I'm right next to the the bank, and they give me the shotgun. Now, I saw a little tiny bit of what was up there. The guys in the front of the canoe got to see way better. It looked like a big tire up on the top of the bank. Well, there's no tires thrown out there in the jungle. Nobody's been out there with a vehicle ever. I thought, they give me the shotgun, and they're kind of encouraging me, go, 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 go get it. I'm thinking, that's not a turkey, it's not a deer, that's a snake. I'm kind of losing my appetite, you know. I don't want to go out and face off with some snake. And they're, they're encouraging me, go, 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 go. And uh, yeah, you, they're always willing to sacrifice you to get breakfast, but I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not that hungry. Well, the guy who was sitting next to me, a real good uh, tribal friend, it's a great guy to learn from. You want to learn hunting or anything about their culture, anything, go with him, but don't trust him. He'll always let you down. He looks up at me and he says, Let's go. I'm going to go with you. So I looked at him. I thought, well, if he's not afraid, then I'm not going to be afraid. So he got up really anxious, got up out of the canoe, got out of the canoe, and he's encouraging me. Go, let's go, let's go. So we start crawling up the bank, about halfway up. A little higher than the ceiling here. About halfway up, he grabs my shoulder and pulls me back. And he says, hey, Hamu, in the head. Where else do you shoot a snake? I don't know how many of you guys have shot snakes before, but anytime you want to kill a snake, he's the head. You don't try to chop off the end of their tail. So I thought, why is he telling me that? We go up a little bit further. Now we're almost to the top, and he grabs my shoulder again. And like with more desperation, he says, Hey, come in the head. Thumbs up. Yeah, we're going to shoot him in the head. Why are you telling me that? Wow. When we finally got up to the top of the, the bank, to the floor of the jungle, it wasn't a snake. It was a huge monster. It was a giant anaconda. And it was sleeping. So I looked back at my buddy. Now, wow, that is a huge hot dog. We're going to really, really... <clears throat> but I had a shotgun, and all my confidence, all my uh, surety was in that shotgun. So I started out towards the anaconda. But he's asleep. <clears throat> I went all the way up to stand right at the edge of him. His head's out there in the middle, not coiled up like they have in the movies. All thrown on, then his head's out there in the middle. And I extended the shotgun... My buddy's right there with me. <clears throat> and I don't know why we always count. You know, count to three, right? One, <laughs> two, three. And pulled the trigger, and it went click. Not bang. Well, sometimes the shotgun shells fail. And so uh, I pulled back the hammer of the gun. And if you think I'm ugly now, I, at that time I was probably pa pale as pale can be and stuck the shotgun out with always the second when it goes off. I count faster. One, two, three. And pulled the trigger again. Click. And the anaconda's eyes open. And it all happened. <clears throat> it all happened in a question of like a half a second. To me, it was like an eternity. The head of that anaconda, not like in the zoo where they're really slothful, just kind of launched out like a spring. Boom! <laughs> And praise God, most missionaries are pretty ugly. And I scared the anaconda. <laughs> well, the anaconda looped around and went down into the river. And I was just kind of like paralyzed. This can't be happening. He went out in the, in the, in the, the, down the bank. And then I turned around to see the face of my buddy. <laughs> Where was he? He's sitting back down there in the canoe. All the other people told me later on, they said, we thought the anaconda ate you because both of you went up and right away 
your buddy came running down and jumped, jumped in the canoe and he didn't say anything. So they're all just sitting there waiting and then it comes the anaconda flying out over the river. <clears throat> Many times we put all of our confidence, all of our hope, all of our trust in the fact that we have control over our lives. And guess what? Even though it can feel that way a lot of the times, that's not reality. And there's a time that comes, and every single one of us here can relate to that. There's a time or times that come in life that you realize that, well, the, even though I did all that I could to control my life and have everything expected to play out like I wanted, life is out of my control. Almost every aspect of life we can find it come out of control, except for one, and that is how you and how I respond to God at any given moment. Now, uh, our time's short. I want to invite you to <clears throat> look at seven verses with me. We're going to go through this really, really quick this morning. It's in Luke chapter 17. <clears throat> In Luke 17, we find a story of ten men that were out of control of their own lives. They had lost, uh, lost the hope of being able to make their own decisions and figure out how they were going to live life and how they wanted things to play out. Nope. Life had changed for them. They were lepers. And a leper in that time didn't have the same rights and privileges as everybody else. They had to be separate or apartado, what do you call it? Like put apart from the rest of society. They couldn't enjoy the, the, uh, the privilege or the, I don't know how you call it, the gustos of being able to be with everybody else. So we're in chapter 17 of Luke. And follow, follow with me here, uh, starting in verse uh, 11. And it came about while Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a certain village, there met him ten leprous men who stood at a distance. Now we have time this morning to get into a bunch of details about this, but <clears throat> the reason why they're at a distance is because since they're they're sick with leprosy. They can't come up and just give people a big hug and say, good to meet you. They had to, by law, they had to stay separate from the rest of society. Uh, I guess probably few or any of us really know what it is to be despised. Know what it's like to be rejected. Know what it's like to always live having to be uh, unclean. In fact, that was what they had to proclaim when somebody came towards them or as they were uh, a leprous per person was coming towards other people, they'd say, unclean, unclean, I'm unclean. Kind of a drag, huh? And so at a distance, they see Jesus coming down the trail, and they had heard of him. Gossip gets around pretty good in all cultures. They heard about Jesus, and so, wow, here's our chance. And they go out, and they raise their voice, calling to Jesus. We're in verse 13. They raise their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. You know, I don't know in our Christianity today if we really value, deeply value, what His mercy is really, really all about. These guys understood. Our lives are out of control. We have no grip on anything. If we have any hope at all, it's you. Everything was in Jesus. They had no other hope at all. Now, from this point of the story on, I want to invite you to kind of <clears throat> run back and forth in the story between where these ten leprous men are, and then every once in a while I want to run back and kind of just stand right behind Jesus and look over his shoulder and see, <clears throat> see things from his point of view. So now let's go on to verse 14. Check this out. Jesus does things always in a very interesting way. It should leave us thinking says that, talking about Jesus, when he saw them, 
he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. Now, it's not talking about the Roman Catholic priest here. It's going, go, go to the village and show yourself to the Levi priest, who, amongst many other responsibilities, had what you could call kind of like a Department of Health duty, in which if somebody said, I've been cleansed, I'm healed now, they would go to the priest and he would run them through a whole bunch of things you can find in Leviticus to show that that really, really, really was cleansed. So Jesus said, go, go show yourself to the priest. The problem is they're still sick. And you can see it in their bodies. Everything starts with that step of what? Faith. And sometimes our faith is intellectual, and so it doesn't reach down to our sandals. That's what conviction's all about. And I think, biblically, faith is really all about full conviction. He says, go show yourself to the priest. And so, what do these guys do? They say, Jesus, no, look at it, we're still sick. They knew that if he said it, it was as good as done. And so they turn around and they start walking down the trail. Still in the uh, verse 14, the second part of it says, and it came about. You might want to underline this. And it came about that as they were going. You got that? As they were going, they were cleansed. So put yourself into the story real briefly here. As these guys are going down the path, they still have leprosy. Oh, I don't know, one of them was, didn't have his nose or whatever, but they uh, leprous, leprous people for a whole, you know, it's a long explanation, but uh, they have many physical defects as a result of leprosy. So you can see it in their bodies, and they're going down the trail. They're heading towards going to present themselves to the priest, but they're still infected with leprosy. And it says, as they were going, I'm healed. You know, one guy sees, look at this, I'm healed. He looks over, you got your nose back. I mean, they're excited. It doesn't give us the details of all that. But they can see that they've been healed. Run back with me real quick and just stand right behind Jesus and look over his shoulder. <clears throat> I don't know if we're going to be able to ask questions later on and get to heaven and, and ask what, you know, what did it look like? What did he do? We don't know what Jesus did. We don't know if he spoke words or if he just thought. If he said, uh, you're healed. If he raised his hand towards him, we don't know. But when Jesus decided, to, okay, you're healed now, and he and he extended that healing power or his mercy to them in that very moment they were healed so you're standing behind Jesus looking over his shoulder now and you see these ten guys heading down towards uh, the village walking by faith and in, a, in an instant Jesus heals them and they find themselves healed they're instantly healed Let's continue to verse 15. It says, Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. Now, there's a lot of parts of this story that leave me scratching my head wondering, how did this play out? I would love to be able to see it up close. So these ten guys are going down the trail, and in an instant, they find themselves healed. There's obviously some conversation going on between them, but one of them stops. He sees that he's been healed, and he stops on the trail. Now, we don't know what the other guys said to him, the other men. They said, what are you doing? Let's go. Hurry up. He looks back at Jesus. Did the other nine guys reprimand him and say, come on, come on, let's go, look at us, we're, we're free, we can go back and eat hamburgers with our relatives, we can hang out with our friends, come on, let's go, it doesn't say what they, it doesn't tell us what they conversed, what was their discussion while they were going down the trail, all we know is that one of the ten stopped, and he turned around, and you can have the absolute surety that Assurance that he looked back 
And he put his eyes right in the eyes of Jesus, and he took off running. And he ran back to where this mercy came from, and he threw himself down <clears throat> on the ground. I'm going to read verse uh, 15 again. Follow with me. It says, Now one of them, when he, had, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He didn't just go back and say, Hey, uh, thanks, I really appreciate your, your mercy. Uh, the other guys there, however you say, ingratos there, uh, not very grateful, but I just want to come back and say thanks, shake his hand and take off. He came back and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and it says, glorifying God with a loud voice. I'm not saying a loud voice is better than a soft voice, but what we're seeing here is that this guy is totally stoked that he received the mercy of God. Verse 16, And he fell on his face at the feet of Jesus. And it says, giving thanks to him. If you have a regular Bible like us old people, uh, you know, one with paper, not a digital one, well, maybe you guys know how to do a digital underline or something, but underline that part there. When it says he went back <clears throat> and he threw himself down at the feet of Jesus, <clears throat> giving thanks to him. In a few minutes, we're going to close here. <clears throat> but let's look over Jesus' shoulder one more time. This whole entire <clears throat> little story of seven verses, Jesus has never moved. He's in the same exact spot. Ten guys came out and they said, Have mercy on us. Jesus said, Okay. And he gave it to them. And they took the gift... And they went their way. They took the blessing. They took the life. They took the mercy. They took the gift. And they went their way. And Jesus is watching ten backs go down the trail. And all of a sudden, one of them stops. And he whips around. And he puts his eyes right in the eyes of Jesus. And he takes off running. And he goes and he throws himself down at the feet of Jesus, thanking him. You watching this whole little movie play out? Jesus sees this guy come up and he throws himself down and he's praising God and he's thanking God for his mercy. And then the little story ends with a question. And the question doesn't need to be here in the Bible. It doesn't need to be there because of the guy that's, that's uh, bowed down before Jesus. The question isn't for him. Jesus asked him the question, but the question was not for him. The question wasn't for the other nine that continued on their merry way. <clears throat> thankful to God because he healed them. Were they not thankful? Of course they were. But it didn't change their life. It changed their existence. Has your Christianity changed your existence? Or has it changed your life? Jesus asked a question. Verse 17, it says, <clears throat> And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was Jesus really asking this guy for an answer? I find that question tucked in the middle of Luke 17 because of people like me. It's a question I have to ask myself. I share it with you this morning hoping that it might be a blessing or a challenge to you in your life. It's a challenge to me. And that is we all find ourselves at a certain point in our lives out of control. We go along in life <clears throat> We have all of our, our assurance and our plans, our ideas, our capabilities, <clears throat> or like that day where I had all of my confidence in a shotgun that was to fail me. And when it failed, 
I went from feeling like I was in control to being somebody that shrunk down to the size of a little ant. And when you feel that, when you find yourself out of control of your life and everything's falling apart around you, or maybe it's all going really, really good in your life, but the question's still there. You asked for God's mercy at some point in your life, and He gave it to you. Did you go your way? Or did you go back and give thanks? And that whole idea of going back and giving thanks includes this idea, too, of <clears throat> God, you gave me life, so this life that I have is not my own. And I want to give it back to you. So Jesus asked him the question, but the question really wasn't for him. It was for me. Maybe it's for a few of us here this morning, too. I don't know. My friend, were there not ten who were healed? Were there not ten who were cleansed? Were there not ten who were out of control of their lives and everything fell apart? Your other nine buddies, where are they? 2,000 years after Christ, we look around our Christian nation today, and that question rings out, is there one God follower out of ten Christians today? Out of ten Christians that have Christian faith, is there one in ten that has gone back to give thanks and to put their life before the one, the life giver? It's the blessing. It's the story of Oscar. It's the story of Ramon the trafficker, Oscar the murderer, uh, Julian the, the witch doctor. And maybe it's a story of your life and my life if we've gone back to give thanks to the life giver, to give thanks to the one that's given us that mercy that at some point, if all of us here today consider ourselves as Christians, then it was because at some point we realized that we need the mercy of God. And we asked for it, and He gave it to us. And then... I'm ashamed to say that many times I think before God, <clears throat> He sees my back, not my face. What He desires for each and every one of us is uh, God followers that go back, maybe many, many times, to give thanks to the life giver and say, you know, Lord, I don't really have anything to offer to you, but I think I can do as good as that leper. I can at least put myself before you and thank you for the life you gave me and then put myself in your hands that you take control over my life and lead me according to your will, your principles, your eternal purposes. I'm going to close in prayer and I brought this up because I always forget stuff. So, If... Um, a few stories from the mission field might encourage your heart today. There's a book <clears throat> over there on that table. There's no charge for anything. There's probably enough for one per family, not one per person. But feel pr free to take one for your family if you'd enjoy some more stories from the mission field. And then uh, something <clears throat> my wife, Uni, and I have been working through a lot with some of our different missionary teams over these last couple of years is the a problem of deep-rooted lack of forgiveness in people's life. So we took a, an old teaching thing we've done with some of our missionary teams and we put it into a, a little book, the, Ro the Road of Applied Forgiveness. If you want, pick up one of those and hopefully that will be a blessing to your life too. Uh, one more word and we'll pray. There's a great need for missionaries today. 2,000 years after Jesus said, all right, I've called disciples, I've showed you what discipleship is all about, and now I've sent, I've sent you, my followers, into all the world to make disciples. There's still people that are waiting their turn. And we can pray all we want for them, but prayers will probably not do it alone. It's going to take somebody like our our leprous buddy here that went back and said, thank you, and here I am, send me. 
and there's some other information about places you can go and uh, learn more about this or be trained for cross-cultural service to be go out from here from this very church to a group where they've never ever heard not one word from the Bible in their whole lives and you can be that ambassador to share God's word abroad. Thank you again for the opportunity and the blessing of being with this great church here in Irvine. And uh, we thank God for each of your lives. Jesus, thank you for your word and what it shows us, what it teaches us. Maybe it's showing us different things to uh, different ones of us here. I think many times when you've looked at me, you haven't seen my face, you've seen my back. It's a pretty embarrassing testimony on my part. Thank you for the opportunity that we have over and over again in this life that when we see our need for your mercy, and we see our need to correct our attitude and our direction in life, we can go back and give thanks to the life giver. We can lay our life down at the feet of the very one that opened up a trail of eternal life for us. And then we can go on and share that with others. You've called us to be disciples, and you've called us to go on and make disciples of others. I ask that you would bless and encourage every single one of my brothers and sisters here this morning. Amen. Thank you, Rick, for the wonderful message and the encouragement. As, at this time, we'd like to continue our worship through offering. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Then he said to them all, 